Item number, SCP-7091. Classified Level 4 Secret. Containment Class, Euclid. Disruption Class, Eki. Risk Class, Danger. Special Containment Procedures. All artifacts and materials collected during the Prometheus mission are to remain within a cryogenic hermetically sealed subterranean vault beneath Site-82. This vault may only be accessed via telepresence drones, automata, and similar technologies which enable remote experiments. At the conclusion of research, any objects which come in contact with SCP-7091 infected material is to be relocated to the incinerator inside the vault and subjected to temperatures of no less than 1500 degrees Fahrenheit. The incinerator scans its contents for SCP-7091 automatically and will repeat the incineration process if necessary. The remaining ashes and residue are then cleared to be disposed of according to standard procedures. Personnel contaminated by SCP-7091 are to be terminated and delivered to the incinerator. While precautions for anomalous biological hazards have been updated for the Safety Foundation employees, the perpetually evolving molecular alterations of SCP-7091 present an ongoing threat. Furthermore, astronomical reports that suggest the existence of an alien megastructure in the Andromeda Galaxy by civilian scientists are to be discredited. Astronomers reporting such finds are to be administered Class B amnestics. Exploration of the Crystallia system and the megastructure therein is forbidden following the conclusion of the Prometheus mission due to the unpredictable nature of SCP-7091. Description SCP-7091 is a sentient, telepathic, parasitic black mold capable of autonomous recombination of organic and inorganic material at the atomic level. Organisms affected by SCP-7091 experience exponential cell regeneration, followed by full or partial paralysis and cessation of autonomous bodily functions. For reasons as yet unknown, SCP-7091 appears to prefer sapient organisms for infection. Discovery In January 2087, Foundation astronomers performing routine paratechnical explorations detected an alien megastructure in the Andromeda Galaxy in a star system approximately 2,487,000 light-years from Earth. The Foundation designated the system Crystallia. Foundation observations of the structure determined that it was a real-world example of a hypothetical Dyson Sphere, a megastructure constructed for the purposes of capturing the entire energy output of its host star. The energy siphoned off by the structure was being transferred directly to the fourth planet in its solar system, designated Crystallia B. The Dyson Sphere is tidally locked with Crystallia B. Although how this is possible given the distance and relative size difference between the two celestial objects is unknown. On 8 June 2087, an expedition to the star system, dubbed the Prometheus Mission, was proposed by the Anomalous Astronomical Division and later approved by the O5 Council. A three-person team of veteran interstellar explorers was dispatched to investigate. Captain Lucy Cabot, Lieutenant Nathaniel Burr, and Ensign Jasmine Gibson were chosen for the mission. Having all participated in deep space explorations into ancient megastructures in the Andromeda Galaxy over the last decade. Their primary objective was to investigate the star system for alien life and to recover technology for study. The explorers boarded the Canticle, an intergalactic exploration vessel. Using its paratechnical long-range translocation drive, the crew were able to jump from the edge of the solar system and arrive nearly instantaneously near Crystallia B. Prometheus Mission Log 01 The following recording was transmitted from the team's body cameras to the ship, where it was relayed to Foundation Headquarters. Log begins. This is Captain Lucille Cabot of the Canticle. We just landed in the Crystallia system and are approaching low orbit of Crystallia B. Time is approximately 0200. All communications and observations, including sensor data, are being recorded for Foundation records. Initial scans indicate the Dyson Sphere is just a glorified solar array. It's too thin for structures unrelated to its primary purpose, so there's nowhere safe to land. Every part of it is dedicated to solar power collection. The energy is being transmitted via an antenna pointing at the planet. As for Crystallia B, there isn't much going on around this rock. There are a few repeating radio signals, hundreds of satellites in disrepair, and even a few derelict starships. 
The planet has plenty of evidence of structures created by intelligent beings. Buildings, roadways, that kind of thing. Also seeing evidence of extensive strip mining, likely to obtain at least part of the materials required for the massive structure at the heart of the system. But unless they're hiding underground, there's no one left alive here. That said, we've decided not to land on Crystallia B. Sensors show the planet is overgrown with an unknown substance, possibly a life form. Based on its spread, we've concluded it poses a significant contamination risk. Captain, I'm detecting another artificial construct. Where? What is it? Some kind of space station. It's orbiting within the planet's Roche limit. Let's see it. The ship's view screen activates, and the edge of the Dyson Sphere appears, dominating the image with its inconceivable size and mass. It is so huge that its entire length cannot be viewed at this distance without panning the camera. It is formed of interlocking triangular panels hundreds of miles wide. Orange lights illuminate the surface, and periodic bursts of gas puff excess heat into the void. A massive antenna thousands of miles long, blinking with a million crimson lights, points out across the intervening space, like an accusatory finger at the tomb of Crystallia B. The megastructure suddenly blurs, fading into a glimmering red-orange smear as the ship's camera focuses on a tiny pinprick of light in the foreground. A space station appears, blossoming into view as the camera zoom in and bring the picture back into focus. Its bulbous modules and asymmetric shape make it seem like a trinket next to the colossal megastructure. Looks like someone's home, Captain. I'm picking up significant signs of life on the inside. Former inhabitants of Crystallia B? Run a deep scan of the area. 5,000 kilometer range. On it. Lieutenant Burr activates the vessel's exterior sensors, inputting the range suggested by Cabot. Colored shapes appear on the view screen, indicating the presence of vehicles, ships, and life forms. Got something. A lot of somethings, actually. Sensors are picking up alien ships, but they're also claiming those ships are life forms. What do you mean? I've got 14 confirmed sensor hits from space foreign vessels, but they're packed together like sardines. It looks like they're daisy chained together or tied up with cable or something. And their shape is weird. I'm getting inconsistent readings on their dimensions. It's like a whole mass is expanding or breathing or something. That doesn't make any sense. Ensign Gibson, run a diagnostic. Aye, Captain. The scanner isn't malfunctioning, Captain. Perhaps this is a new anomaly. Could be. I can also run tests for local Hume levels. Local reality is stable. Hmm. Run a bioanalysis. Whoa. That's it. They're covered in the same growth that's choking the planet. It grows in hard vacuum? That's definitely weird. They're gonna want us to check it out, but I don't want to mess with that mass of ships. Docking options? Too much of that stuff on this side. We're gonna have to try port side. Bring us around, Denson. Copy. Gibson activates the thrusters and angles the vessel towards the port side of the space station. Got a docking bay door here that looks promising. As Gibson adjusts their vector, Burr puts a docking bay door on the main view screen. Thick fibrous strands form a web around a gap in the door where the nose of a derelict starfighter juts out into the vacuum. Looks like that ship pushed the door off its tracks. More of that weird organism, Captain, but its spread seems light in this area, relatively speaking. Orders? Cut the bay doors open with the incision laser. Aye. Burr enters several keystrokes on his terminal, accessing the ship's weapon systems. He sets a path for the laser and carefully cuts through the door. Reverse 15 meters. Don't scratch our paint. Gibson gently reverses the throttle, easing the canticle away from the space station. The fibrous web cling to the metal as the laser cuts the door free and it snaps back slamming against the side of the station. Do we have enough room to land? Aye, Captain. Take us in, Ensign. Gibson carefully moves the vessel inside, sitting them down on a relatively clear section of the deck. Shut down non-essential systems and redirect power to the Canticle AIC. Gibson, set the AIC to try and gain access to the station's computer if it has one. Aye, Captain. Once that's finished, let's suit up and find out what we're dealing with. 
Gibson, you and I will take assault weapons. Burr, I want you on the flamer in case we need to burn away any of that mess. The crew dons their vac suits and disembarks through the canticle airlock. Relying on their mag boots to keep their footing, Lieutenant Burr takes point with his flamethrower, followed by Ensign Gibson and the captain. It's dark in the docking bay, and they activate their low-light optics. The interior of the structure is abandoned. Large crates of what appear to be rations and medical supplies float haphazardly across the deck. There are two large frigates present, bristling with weapons. They dwarf the canticle with their armored bulk. Both are coated in a thick layer of rust and black particulate that sways gently in the airless docking bay. Glad these ships aren't shooting at us. Looks like they wouldn't be able to for long. Agreed. The holes are ruined. Too shot for deep space. Plus, I don't see repair tools or automatons of any kind. They were probably marooned here. From the ceiling, interwoven strands hang like cobwebs and reach down the walls like tree roots to the floor of the docking bay. What the hell is that shit? Lieutenant? Burr shifts the weight of the flamer on his shoulder and pulls a handheld scanner off his suit. Sending the readings to the Canticle AIC. Okay, got something. Yep, it's the same stuff growing on the ship outside and on Crystolia B. Looks like some kind of fungus or mold. It's not in the database. Wait a minute, scanner's picking up something else. What is it? There are... Holy shit, there are people in there. Within the strands, between the wall and the leftmost frigate, emaciated cadavers of a humanoid alien are fused to the floor. Their skin has been overwhelmed with the mold, leaving them blackened and withered. Elaborate. Well, from what I can see, they've got long limbs, probably twice as long as the average human. Their heads are bulbous and enlarged, although whether they're the result of infestation or their natural shape is unclear. Looks like four eyes, a large pair near the top of the head and a smaller subset on the side of the skull. They're completely covered in mold. Cabot steps forward past Lieutenant Burr to get a better look. Gibson follows, sweeping the area around them for threats with their assault weapon. The eyes of the dead are glossed over and peer lifelessly out of the tangled web of mold particulate. However, when Captain Cabot shines a light over them, their pupils dilate and track the light back and forth. What do you make of this? It's fucking weird, sir. Thank you, Ensign. I concur. Burr? There must still be some neural activity, given the physiological response. Scanner confirmed it, actually, but it's not limited to the bodies. All the fungal growth is pulsing with signals that could be analogous to neural activity, but unless you want to start poking them with a stick, I can't tell you if the infected are still alive or not. That won't be necessary. Let's proceed. Captain, Canticle AIC reports limited station system access. Backup power can be restored on your command. Do it, Ensign. Bringing power back online now. Somewhere deep within the cold hulk of the station, power systems spool up and come online. A deep, barely perceptible hum reverberates through the floor. An emergency warning light illuminates the ruined docking bay door, and a blast shield falls into place, crushing the nose of the fighter that was pointed out into space and sealing the chamber from the vacuum outside. gas pour into the room from vents in the ceiling as the station life support comes back online. Artificial gravity comes up next. The floating detritus on the docking bay clatters to the floor. Overhead, several strands of particulate snap under the sudden weight of a half a dozen frozen alien bodies who crash to the ground near the crew. Several of them begin to move sluggishly pushing themselves off the floor with their long arms and muttering in an alien tongue. Looks like they're still alive. Is that great? I feel like I've heard that before. Can you translate, Gibson? Patching the audio into the canticle. I'm a tad out of practice with old extragalactic dialects, but... Okay, you're right. It's a craig dialect. It sounds like three words. Consume, expand, and grow? 
pretty sure that's a mold talking. The aliens climb to their feet. Black spores swirl around their desiccated frames. The crew raise their weapons in response. Canticle, translate my words into the Craig dialect for the sake of our new friends. Stop, or we will open fire on you. Come. The speaker and the captain suit broadcast a message, but the aliens do not respond. They step forward, reaching out for the crew with their cold, mold-covered hands. Burr, cook up. So much for first contact. If you want to give the next batch a hug before I burn them to cinders, you go right ahead. The crashing sound is heard from deeper within the artificial structure. The team members keep their weapons raised as Cabot leads them toward the door to the interior. She looks through the glass viewport. Looks safe enough. Fuck. The door's stuck. Gibson, breach it. Aye, Captain. Gibson steps forward and pulls a tube applicator gun from her suit. Ready, Captain. The interior looks clear, but I want us on tactical footing for the rest of the operation. Yes, sir. Acknowledged. The team moves to stand adjacent to the doorway, waiting for Cabot's signal. Light it. Let's go. Burr takes point with the flamer, followed by Gibson, with Cabot taking up the rear. They enter a triangular corridor, pleased to see that the presence of the anomalous mold has diminished significantly. Craig's sigils have been hastily scrawled across the walls and floor. Gibson, what can you tell me about these symbols? Mm, Canticle IAC says something about a spread. This character is typically associated with infection or mold. It's got to be a warning about that shit on the walls. A warning? Seems a little late for that, don't you think? Maybe it's not for them, but for people like us. Let's keep moving. This place must have some sort of command center, and I want to find it. Log ends. Prometheus Mission Log 02. The following footage was recorded after several hours of exploration aboard the space station. No information relevant to the anomaly was recorded, hence its exclusion from this document. Footage resumes in what the Canticle AIC identified as the antechamber to the station's command center. Log begins. The team stands before a large sliding door covered in the anomalous mold. Vine-like structures have formed along its entire length. Cabot attempts to access the door via the control panel on the right side. Despite a neon light suggesting a successful connection, the door remains sealed. Oh, security in this place is great. So many doors that won't cooperate. Thermite? I'm leaning that way. But I want to exhaust our other options first. Maybe the canticle can get it open if we find the system it's connected to? The center of the antechamber contains a tall, mold-ridden control pedestal with an inactive display. Lieutenant Burr walks around the pedestal, letting the Canticle AIC get a good look at it through his body camera. Can the AIC access it? I think so. Let's see. Lights within the pedestal turn on, and its internal cooling system activates as the display comes alive. Burr can't read the symbols on the display, so the lieutenant focuses on his own terminal navigating through the AIC's understanding of its function. I think I got something, folks. Gibson and Cabot make their way over to Burr. He holds out his arm so Gibson can look at his terminal. Yeah, looks like you found some kind of emergency control mechanism. Look here. Back up, or second. This one says entrance. Might open that door. Burr taps the holographic dial below the entrance sigil. Seconds later, gears and other machinery can be heard turning. There's a loud stuttering sound, as if the mechanism has been obstructed by a foreign object. Let me see what you're doing. Opening her own terminal, Gibson accesses the interface built by the AIC. Um, yeah, here we go. I've got this. Gibson turns a few of the dials, diverting power to the door mechanism from other areas in the space station. A few minutes later, the vine-like structures keeping the door closed snap under the increased force, and the door grinds open. Good work, folks. 
Cabot pats Gibson's shoulder and leads her team to the command center door. The floor is covered with mold and in far greater concentration than previously observed. I don't recommend we walk in this, Captain. No telling what it will do to our suits. Burn us a path. Aye, Captain. Bird takes point, sweeping the flamer back and forth across the surface of the mold. It shrinks and withers before the onslaught, shriveling and flaking away to ash as the lieutenant advances. The walls were built with metal plates, now twisted and reformed so their original shape is indiscernible. Metal alloy spheres levitate above short pillars arranged in parallel rows. Both are saturated by mold. Large display monitors are suspended at an angle from the ceiling, displaying flashing emergency symbols. Uh, Captain, what the hell is that? Burr releases the trigger on his flamethrower as everyone turns to look at what Gibson has discovered. In one corner of the room, an alcove once contained control terminals. Now, a pattern drawn with bits of flesh and viscous fluids covers the floor, contaminated with the creeping mold. It resembles an alien face with closed eyes. Hanging above it are the bodies of several aliens suspended upside down by vine-like filaments. Their forms have merged together, forming a single mass of bone, mold, and flesh. What the actual fuck? Oh, well, that's gross as hell. Permission to incinerate, sir! No, just leave it alone. At the far end of the chamber, the team finds two alien cadavers. The bodies are approximately three meters tall and likely possessed a large amount of muscle mass before the mold infected them. Each cadaver has seven digits on each hand and a degenerate foot structure, although the cadaver on the left is missing one of its legs. They look like they're hugging. You want to join them, Gibson? Not unless you're going to set them on fire. One of the bodies turns its head towards the team and reaches its hand out, pointing with a finger. The mouth moves as it attempts to speak. No sound is forthcoming as its speech is impeded by webbed strands of mold blocking its mouth. The team steps back, raising their weapons. Maybe he's hungry. I don't think they want to eat what we're serving. Is that a book? A journal sits on a table nearby, miraculously devoid of mold. Burr scans it and nods at Gibson, who picks it up and stuffs it into the biohazard container bag before handing it off to Cabot. The mold-ridden cadaver is still pointing its eyes looking at each one of them in turn and reaching out, pointing with its seven-fingered hand. Wait a minute. Step back. The crew moves away from the cadavers, stepping out of the path of the creature's finger. It is pointing at the cluster of fused bodies hanging from the ceiling at the far end of the room. The cluster's eyes twitch open in their sockets and turn as one to look at Cabot and her crew. The vines have regrown around the door. They contract so... Shit, Captain, that's a problem. Not as much of a problem as that. The mass of amalgamated flesh has begun to move. Dozens of elongated arms unfold like flower petals from the cluster of fused bodies as the mass lowers itself to the floor. Its eyes fixed on the crew. Fuck! Weapons free! Push your barrels towards the crew, its many hands pounding on the deck as it drags itself along. Its top half sways precariously under the weight of so many bodies. It shrugs off the energy blast from Cabot and Gibson's assault weapons, but cringes away from the flamethrower. Montana left! Shit! Recognizing that her energy weapon doesn't have the stopping power they need, Cabot draws a high caliber revolver from her shoulder holster. steps forward just as Cabot fires her last shot. She slams the revolver back into its holster and raises her energy rifle again just as Burr steps forward and baptizes the monstrosity in fire. Fire burns through several of the creature's arms as it tries to flee. It collapses in a heap and splits in the middle. Several aliens try to climb out of the cavity, but are caught in the conflagration. 
They wither as the fire burns away the last facsimile of life. Jesus. Yeah, I think God clearly did not have a good plan for them. Let's pack it in and go home. I've had enough of this shit. Log ends. The following content was transcribed by the Canticle Artificially Intelligent Conscript and transmitted to Site-83 for analysis. Log begins. Twelfth Air Myth, Cycle 900. I cannot believe that it actually worked! Septimus scientists and engineers have created a fully functioning solar siphoning device! Crescentia will have limitless power until the star's death! May the moons bless us for eternity. A problem persists now. Although we have conquered our star, bent all twelve planets to our will, and have mapped our galaxy to the last grain of sand, the smallest dwarf planet, we are still mortal. Though our average lifespan now extends 500 years, immortality still eludes us. If we can achieve this, our society can spread to every corner of this universe. I have brought this issue to Septimus' attention. He seemed upset at first at my insistence that we divert resources to this pursuit, but he was easily persuaded to let me undertake the endeavor to attain eternity for our people. Together, we will conquer the universe! 19th Air Myth, Cycle 900. While cyberization and digitization offer some solutions, I find them unsatisfying. Cyberization has allowed us to increase the longevity of a normal creation by 15% at the cost of routine maintenance and regular replacement of machine parts. But digitization feels like a form of death in and of itself. Septimus has assigned a team of experts to assist me. One is a cyborg named Alf. They suggest abandoning cybernetic augmentation for powered biotech. I'm not convinced this is the solution, but incremental steps may be needed before we fully solve the problem of death. May the moon bless these wayward explorers! 45th Air Myth, Cycle 900. The first powered biomechanical creations have received their augmentations. Elf's designs are sound, and I expect life expectancy for these ones will improve considerably. I wish I could join Septimus aboard the space station, but he says my place is here on Crescentia, in the lab, working on a solution to ensure the perpetual survival of our species. I miss him. I hope he visits me soon. May the moons guide us to immortality. Third Haleth. Cycle 950. Fifty cycles have passed and we have made only small improvements to our initial gains. Alf has been a tremendous help, but we are at a loss as to what we should try next. Genetic experimentation has long been taboo among our people, but 45 cycles ago we began experimenting on the genetic code of newly hatched creations, isolating the gene sequence that causes our inevitable biodegradation and removing it. The children appeared normal at first. They aged and developed quicker than one would expect, with their metamorphosis occurring during their 30th cycle as opposed to their mid-70s. However, despite essentially removing death from their genomes, each child experienced rapid cellular degradation at 42. None from our trial made it to see their 45th cycle. I am heartbroken. Never in all my years did I think I would be responsible for the death of so many children. Septimus took a short reprieve from overseeing the solar siphoning device to deal with the parents himself. I never saw any of them again. Elf assures me that we are approaching a breakthrough. I hope they are right. I wish I didn't have to make these sacrifices, but it has become clear that I can no longer avoid them. This is for the greater good. Fourteenth Air Myth, Cycle 1075. I am 275 today. I felt a kink in my bones for the first time today. Alf and I unleashed a modified strain of the Xanthan virus on a small group of creations about a hundred cycles ago. The work was time-consuming and difficult. 
but the work is done. The older patients succumb to the expected symptoms. Violent coughing, sloughing of the skin, loss of extremities. But the younger ones developed an innate inoculation against our little virus. At first, they were unaffected. But as the cycle passed and they grew older, they did not show any signs of visible age or degradation. Their skin was smooth as the day they completed metamorphosis. They were agile, alert, and quick to react. Unlike me, that is. This is it! The solution we've been looking for! I cannot wait to bring Septimus this news! May the moons bring us joy for eternity to come. Cycle 1075. Alf and I brought one of the xanthan infected creations with us to meet Septimus. They are immune to solar radiation, and this one, in particular, actually favors space travel. Septimus was pleased with our work. When we returned to Crescentia, however, our companion became ill immediately. They complained of headaches, body soreness, and complained that its organs were being crushed under the gravity of our planet. Although they were rushed to a medical facility, they passed away shortly after. My research has concluded that the change in gravity and atmosphere had unforeseen side effects on the physiology of those affected by the modified xanthan virus. For all intents and purposes, those affected with the strain are not able to leave Crescentia, or any planet, and return without disastrous consequences. This is a massive setback, but one we can recover from. I am close to a breakthrough. May the moons guide us. Fourth Caleb, cycle 1214. Septimus grows old. His working days are nearly over. I, too, am getting on in my years. I should have offspring by now, and they should be rearing the next generation of creations into life. And yet, here I am with Elf. Stuck in the confines of this infernal laboratory, trying to understand why I cannot release us from the binds of mortality. I am 314, and I have accomplished nothing! 16th Air Myth, 1300. Since Septimus Solar Siphoning Device came online, the temperature of our planet and its moons have increased significantly. Alf went to our smallest moon to investigate a new fungal growth discovered there. It seems to have infected them, somehow. Alf has been quarantined to prevent further spread of the mold. Attempts have been made to treat Alf, but his cells regenerate so quickly nothing can be done to extract the fungus. Remarkably, Alf claims they feel well enough, despite the obvious change to their physical appearance. I hope they aren't suffering from delirium. Septimus has been silent lately. I dare not approach him on the space station. I will find a solution for you, Septimus. Or my name isn't Alenya. 14th Haleth, 1389. Alf does not age. What was thought to be fungus in their internal structure was actually mold, black in color, and a lie. Examinations of their internal structure have concluded that Alf's organs, including those critical to survival, had simply died. They were overtaken by the mold and were now operating under its instruction. The body is dead, and yet Alf remains, autonomous and of sound mind. Apart from the severe cough and the occasional expulsion of black spores from their mouth, Alf is well. Tomorrow I will board a ship to the space station and bring Septimus the news myself. Could we be immortal at last? I have made an error. The mold is highly infectious. Despite our precautions, the medical facility where Elf is quarantined has been compromised. I was contaminated and brought it onto the station with me. The mold does more than generate the body, as I have found out through observation. But there is good news. It seems to adapt to the will of the host. Septimus and his construction crew have found renewed strength since their infection, and they have been able to lift objects and metamaterials without machine assistance. The food harvesters can collect raw material more quickly, our physical champions perform athletic feats significantly easier and with a lower reaction time, our scientists, including myself, have shown enhanced intelligence. 
This mold is truly a gift from the moons. I am grateful to Alf for discovering it. Soon we will be able to explore with our undying bodies. I find it harder and harder to think of anything else. Perhaps I am excited. Perhaps I am obsessed. Either way, I cannot wait to see what will become of our exploration. The universe awaits. I've finally been permitted to move to the space station. I have worked diligently my entire life, and now I will rest for a time before joining Septimus in his work. My mind wanders sometimes. My thoughts are my own on most days, but every so often I find that I am uh, absent from my body. It is as if my body is acting on its own accord in these moments when I am not there, but I cannot confirm this on my own. Alf claims to have felt the same way. No one else that we've talked to has, though. Perhaps it is the stress of expansion that is getting to us. Every time we try to conduct tests on ourselves, though, we find that the same circumstances occur. Recording devices that we set up are dismantled at our hand. Outside observers lose interest and leave once testing begins. I heard it today. The voice. It was telling me to grow, to expand, to consume. It is a base thing, one that stems from a place I do not wish to know. My mind fights for control, but the battle is harder with each passing cycle. There are days when I cannot see my environment, and all I see is the mold. I can feel it growing slowly in my internal anatomy. I can feel the fuzzy pricks of cilia behind my eyes and in my teeth and beneath my scales. I wanted to ask Alf if they had felt the same symptoms as I, but all that came out of my mouth was... Rose. The creations all look the same now. Their eyes are black and fuzzy. Their scales are made of cilia. Their bodies are made of mold. I can hear them talking to me, though their mouths do not move. They whisper into my ear about the darkness, about the hunger, about the sweat. I do not want to go into that dark place. It's spreading at alarming rates. It covers a quarter of the planet now. Septimus is building automatons to help pilot a ship into deep space. There are not enough of us to escape the mold. It will grow. It will spread. It will consume. There is no stopping it. We are immortal. We are one. My thoughts are hardly my own anymore. I can hear the thoughts of my people echoing in my mind more intensely now. It is overwhelming at times, but there are moments where their voices are quiet. It never stops, though. The voices, that is. They cry and blame me for their suffering in this collective consciousness. They want freedom. I cannot give them this. I am always hungry. Infected on space station, my hands hurt, my mind hurts. Can't control myself much longer. I am fun. I am everything. I am everywhere. I am Christentia. I am the moon. I am myself. The hunger is excruciating. I ate the creation, absorbed their body into mine. I felt full, 
I must eat again. The spread. The growth. The universe is a morsel and I am a predator. It awaits my consumption. I am in that dark place now. I can feel myself slipping deeper each day of a cycle that passes by. I can hardly feel the thought outside of the hunger. Someone, please save me.